Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're going deep, literally. We're talking excavation safety. Ooh, that sounds kind of dirty. I like it. Yeah, we're going to be digging into OSHA standard 1926.650. Okay. All about the key terms and definitions. Mm -hmm. You know, as safety professionals, we got to have this stuff down pat. Yeah, you got to know what you're talking about. Yeah. You can't just, you know, wing it when it comes to safety. Exactly. It can be the difference between like a safe job site and a total disaster. Absolutely. So are you ready to excavate some knowledge? I know I am. Let's dig in. All right. So first things first, excavations and trenches. Okay. Some people, you know, they use those terms interchangeably, but OSHA says, no, 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 they're different. They are different. So what's the difference? Like, what's an excavation? Well, broadly speaking, an excavation is any man-made cut, cavity, trench, or depression in the Earth's surface formed by Earth removal. So think about it like this. Okay. If you are moving dirt to create a space, you got an excavation. Right. Okay. So any construction project pretty much where you're digging a hole. You got it. That's an excavation. Okay. That makes sense. Now a trench. Okay. It's a specific type of excavation. Okay. What makes it a trench? Well, first of all, it's deeper than it is wide and the width at the bottom can't be more than 15 feet. Okay. So it's that classic ditch. Okay. I'm with you. So a trench is always an excavation. Yes. But not all excavations are trenches. Correct. All right. I got it. Yeah. Now, what if we have an excavation that's you know, initially it's wider. Right. But then there are like forms or structures within it that effectively narrow the space. Yeah. Does that change things? That's a really good question. And it does highlight a very important nuance. Okay. Even if the excavation, like you said, starts out wider, if you put those forms or structures in, that actually can cause it to be classified as a trench. Oh, interesting. Yep. The presence of those structures really changes the... Um, kind of dynamics of the space, Which right? It makes it more confined. Yeah. Potentially more hazardous. Yeah, you're changing the shape of the space. Exactly. All right, so it's not just the initial dimensions, but also how those dimensions are impacted by stuff that's in there. Absolutely. Okay, got it. So let's talk about the competent person. Oh, yeah. This is a like a big deal on any ex excavation site. This is really where, um, where things get interesting because OSHA really stresses the role of the competent person. Right. Because, I mean, they're the ones, the guardians of safety on that site. Yeah, this isn't just somebody who's been on a few job sites and knows, you know, a thing or two. Right. This is a very specific definition by OSHA. Absolutely. So, like, what makes somebody a competent person? Okay, so according to OSHA, a competent person is someone who is able to identify existing and predictable hazards. Okay. So that means they have to understand soil mechanics, yeah, excavation procedures, all the potential dangers. They're like walking hazard detectors, right? They're constantly assessing the site. Yeah, pretty much. And not only that, they have to be able to recognize conditions that are unsanitary, hazardous, or dangerous to employees. Okay. But here's the really important part. Yeah. They must have the authority to take prompt corrective measures to eliminate them. Okay, so it's not just knowledge, it's power too. Exactly. They can't just say, oh, hey, this is wrong. They got to be able to do something about it. They got to be able to stop work if they need to. Wow. To make sure everybody's safe. That's that's a big responsibility. Huge responsibility. Can you think of like an example? Sure. Like a real world scenario mm -hmm. where a competent person, you know, their actions could actually prevent like a terrible accident. Let's imagine um, a competent person is on site and they observe cracks forming oh, yeah. at the top of a trench wall. Uh oh. Now, they recognize that as a sign of potential soil instability, right? <laughs> That's like a major red flag. Big time. And because they have the authority, they can halt the excavation work immediately. Okay. And implement additional safety measures. Like what? Like shoring or sloping. You know, it stabilizes that trench before anybody gets hurt. Wow. Yeah. That's that's a great example. Yeah, it's really all about prevention. Yeah. Their knowledge and authority literally could save lives. For sure. All right. Well, let's move on to um, how we protect those workers in excavations. So protective systems. Okay. What are those? So protective systems, think of it like a safety net for excavation work. It's a whole range of strategies and things that you're doing to keep people safe from the hazards. Okay. And this can include things like support systems, okay. sloping, and benching techniques, and shielding. All right. So it's like a whole like multi-layered approach. Exactly. Okay. So support systems sound like they're all about like physically supporting the sides of the excavation. Yeah. 
to prevent it from caving in. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. You want to prevent that soil from moving, right? Yeah. And so there are a lot of different techniques that fall under this category. Underpinning, bracing, shoring, all of those things. And each method is going to be chosen based on a lot of different things, like what kind of soil you have. Oh, okay. How deep is your excavation? You know, there's a lot of site-specific things that go into that decision. So knowing about like soil mechanics is pretty important. Soil mechanics is crucial. You got to know what kind of soil you're dealing with okay. to know what kind of support it needs. Right. And, you know, loose, sandy soil behaves very differently than a nice, dense clay. Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. Now, shoring and shielding. Mm. These seem to get a lot of attention. They do. Wow. Well, because both are very important for creating a safe working zone inside of that excavation. So with shoring, okay. shoring is all about actively supporting those excavation walls. So ah. think about like building a temporary structure inside the excavation to hold back that soil. Okay. And there are lots of different materials that are used for this. Like what? Sturdy timber, you know, metal hydraulic systems. It really depends on what you need, you know, for your conditions. Yeah. What's the right fit? Now, I've seen those shoring systems and they're like, they almost look like these giant puzzles. Yeah, they do. Like with all those different components, yeah. what are all those things called? So you have uprights. Okay. Those are the vertical members that run along the sides of the excavation. Okay. And they're going to be transferring that pressure from the soil to the other components of the shoring system. Then you have cross braces. Boy. Those are the horizontal members that span across the excavation and they're going to connect the uprights resisting that inward force and then i see those ones that run like parallel to the excavation face yes those are called whales okay and those are going to provide additional support to those uprights so they're helping distribute the load more evenly and they're adding a lot of strength to the system so it all works together it all works together like like a good team exactly each component plays a role and you know the combined strength ensures the safety of the workers inside now how are shields different from shoring. Okay. Are those just like, you know, the, the trench boxes? So shields, also known as trench boxes, yes. Okay. They offer protection in a slightly different way than shoring does. So yeah. shoring is actively supporting the soil. Right. A shield is actually creating a protective barrier between the worker and those excavation walls. So imagine a prefabricated room placed inside the trench. Oh. Okay. It's a safe zone, right? If a cave-in was to occur. So it's almost like more like passive protection. It is in a way, yes. Okay. Shields, they're not preventing that soil movement. Right. But they're protecting workers from being engulfed by it. I see. Okay. And they're often used in situations where like shoring is impractical. Oh, okay. Or maybe it's too time consuming to actually install. Got it. And there are different types of shields. Really? Yeah. So, you got pre-manufactured job built shields, mm. permanent or portable, all sorts of things. Wow. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Okay. All right. So. Let's talk about the kind of like the, the thing that everybody worries about, right? Yeah. Cave-ins. Yeah. How does OSHA define that? Like, what is a cave-in? So the definition's pretty vivid. It's the separation of a massive soil or rock material from the side of an excavation, dot, 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 sudden movement, dot, 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 entrap, bury, or otherwise injure and immobilize a person. Ooh, that's scary. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of makes you like really understand why all these precautions are necessary. For sure. And it's not just like the soil itself that can fail, right? Right. What about the actual protective systems? Yes. Yeah. If those fail. If those fail, it can absolutely lead to a cave-in. Okay. So this could be anything, like a structural member breaks, it gets displaced, deformed, anything that compromises its ability to, you know, hold back that earth. It's like a chain reaction almost, right? Yeah. Like one weak link, it can cause the whole thing to go. All right. So this may seem kind of basic, but I think it's good to just like clarify. Yeah. Stable rock versus unstable rock. Sure. Because, I mean, that's a like a fundamental concept here. Yeah. It's a fundamental concept, but it's definitely worth revisiting for sure. So stable rock. Okay. Natural solid mineral material that can be excavated with vertical sides and will remain intact while exposed. So it's strong enough to stand on its own. It can stand on its own. You don't need to support it. Nope. Okay. And unstable, obviously the opposite. Unstable, prone to movement, prone to collapse. Got it. You cannot rely on it to maintain its integrity. Okay. You got to do something to it. So one's like a solid foundation. One's like a ticking time bomb. 
basically. That's a good way to think about it. Oh, yeah. and, 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 and to decide whether a rock is stable or unstable. Yeah. It's not a guessing game. Right. OSHA says you need to get an assessment by a registered professional engineer. Makes sense. You wouldn't want to just like eyeball it. And, and, and speaking of engineers, yeah. you know, they're pretty important in this whole process. Yeah. So like, what do we mean when we say accepted engineering practices? So accepted engineering practices, that refers to methods and principles that are widely recognized and accepted within the engineering community okay. for designing safe structures. So it's not just about like, you know, gut feeling or like doing what you think is right. Right. It's, there's a like a whole science behind this. Exactly. It's about me. taking that scientific data driven approach to excavation safety. OK. And that is where that registered professional engineer comes in. They are the ones who are qualified to approve those designs for protective systems Got it. and to make sure that they meet those accepted engineering practices. What about tabulated data? I've seen that in the OSHA stuff, too. Yeah. Like, what is that? So tabulated data is like the super valuable tool for engineers okay. designing those support systems. And basically, it's pre-calculated tables, charts, that kind of thing. Oh. And it tells you about the strength and load-bearing capacity of all the different materials, all yeah. the different configurations. So it's like, like a reference guide. It's a reference guide. To help them like simplify the process, but still make sure it's safe. Absolutely. It lets them design safe support systems without having to do all those complex calculations okay. from scratch every single time. Makes sense. Yeah. So we've covered a lot. We went from like... Basic definitions yeah. of excavations and trenches yep. to all this complex stuff about like shoring and shielding mm -hmm. competent persons, engineers. I mean, it's pretty clear that, you know, understanding these terms is like super fundamental to excavation safety. Absolutely. It's the foundation. Yeah. But how do we like how do we take all this theoretical knowledge and make it real? That is a great question. And that's what we're going to be talking about next. OK, stay tuned. Stay tuned. We're going to get into how all these definitions empower you to identify hazards, communicate effectively, and make informed decisions. You know, so you can actually prevent those accidents on excavation sites. That's what we want. Absolutely. Welcome back to the deep dive. You know, bef before we go any further, yeah. let's think about all these terms and how they connect back to you guys. Right. Our listeners. Yeah, you're the safety professionals. You're the boots on the ground making sure all these regulations actually happen actually turn into real world safety why should you care about all these definitions yeah it's more than just textbook knowledge it is right, right? we've been talking about all these terms we have but it's about understanding how they actually apply to your everyday work exactly. so when yeah. you're on those excavation sites it's about taking this knowledge and making it actionable so imagine you're walking onto a site can you look around and spot the hazards right can you tell if a trench is properly shored? Exactly. Then, Can you look at the soil and be like, yeah, that's stable? Or, whoops, that's not. Do you know what everybody's supposed to be doing? Yeah. The workers, the supervisors, the engineers? Right, everybody. That's where these definitions come in. They're your tools to make sure things are safe. Yeah, you got to be able to translate like OSHA language. Yes. Into what's actually happening on the site. Exactly. You have to see it. You, you have to see it come to life. And then if you see something that's just not right. Right. You need to be able to say, hey, this isn't okay. And you have to use the right words. Because if you don't know the right words. If you can't speak the language. They might not take you seriously. Exactly. You might have to explain to a supervisor why a certain excavation is actually a trench. Or why the shoring setup doesn't meet the tabulated data requirements. You know, clear communication using the correct terminology. It's all about being on the same page. It is. It's crucial. Yeah, so everybody on the site knows what we're talking about. Exactly. It's like this shared vocabulary for safety. So you can't just know the words. you got to be able to use them. Advocate for safe practices. Be that safety champion. Yes. The more fluent you are in this language of excavation safety. Right the better you'll be at protecting yourself and your coworkers. 100%. But right, let's revisit some terms that sometimes people get a little confused about. Okay. Especially when they come to these shoring systems. So cross braces. Yeah. Remind me what's so important about where those go. Okay, so cross braces, think of them as the horizontal supports 
that span across the excavation. Yep. And they connect those uprights on opposite sides. Right, right. And yeah, their spacing is absolutely critical for making sure there's enough support. Okay, so they're resisting the pressure from the soil. Exactly. Yeah. That inward pressure, they're stopping those walls from collapsing in. Yeah, nobody wants that. No, yeah. and their placement is super important. It's not just random. You can't just eyeball it and be like, yeah, that looks good. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's not one size fits all. No, it's not. You got to calculate it carefully based on things like the depth, the soil type, and the engineering design of the whole system. So you can't just wing it? Nope. If you put those cross braces too far apart... Uh-oh. They might not be able to hold up. Okay, that makes sense. It's all about keeping those walls stable. Exactly. And then you have your uprights. Right, the vertical ones. The vertical members, those are the backbone of the whole shoring system. Okay. They transfer the pressure from the soil to the cross braces and all the other parts of the structure. Got it. So they take a lot of the force. Yeah. And then you have your whales. Right. The horizontal supports that go along the face. Yes. Those provide extra support to the uprights. They keep them from like buckling or bending under all that pressure. So they're kind of distributing the load a little bit. Exactly. It's yeah. all about working together. Teamwork. Just like on a good job site. I like that. Okay. So speaking of teamwork. Yes. We've talked about the engineers. Right. And they design those systems. They assess the soil stability. Mm -hmm. But how do safety professionals and those engineers actually work together? So it's all about communication. Okay. And mutual respect. Yeah. You know, ideally, those two groups should be talking constantly. Throughout the whole project. The whole thing. From the initial planning. Wow. All the way to the end when you're backfilling. So it's not just a one-time interaction. It's an ongoing collaboration. That makes sense. Because the safety professionals, they have all that knowledge about OSHA regulations. Exactly. Hazard recognition and risk assessment. They're the eyes and ears on the ground. And then the engineers, they're bringing the technical expertise. Right, all that soil mechanics and structural design. So it's a true partnership. It is. Everybody's knowledge is important. Everybody's knowledge is important. So let's say, for example, okay. a safety professional sees some signs of unstable soil while they're excavating. Uh oh they can immediately flag that to the engineer. Right. And then the engineer can do a deeper assessment and recommend changes to the protective system. So maybe the shoring needs to be adjusted. Maybe. Right. Or maybe you need a whole different kind of support system. And then on the flip side, yeah. the engineer may have designed this complex shoring system. Right. And the safety professional can say, hey, Here's how we can implement this safely. Exactly. So the workers aren't exposed to any hazards. It's all about communication. So this could prevent a lot of problems. It really can. Proactive communication is key. And it's not just about reacting to problems when they happen. Right. It's about building that culture of safety. Okay, yeah. Where everyone understands the risks and takes responsibility for preventing accidents. So it's about building trust, making everyone feel like they're part of the solution. Exactly. Everyone's a safety advocate. Now, we've talked a lot about the physical danger. Right. Cave-ins, soil instability. Yes. But there's also those invisible hazards. Oh, yeah. Working in the air. Exactly. The hazardous atmospheres. Okay. And OSHA's definition is pretty broad. It includes anything that could be explosive, flammable, poisonous, corrosive, irritating, or oxygen deficient. Wow, that's a big list. It is. It's easy to focus on what you can see. Right. But these invisible hazards, they can be just as deadly. Because you might not know they're there. Exactly. You can't always see them or smell them, and that makes them even more dangerous. So you have to be extra careful? Extra careful, and you have to monitor the air quality. Okay. So why are excavations like prone to these hazardous atmospheres? Well, excavations are often confined spaces. Right. So things can build up quickly, gases, fumes, vapors. It can become dangerous fast. Okay. So it's really crucial to understand what can cause these hazardous atmospheres. Right. And then take steps to prevent them. Exactly. So what are some common sources that we should be looking out for? Well, leaky underground utilities are a big one. Like gas lines, sewer pipes. Exactly. They can release all sorts of nasty stuff into the excavation. And yeah. then you have decomposing organic matter. Like rotting wood vegetation. Yeah, that can produce methane gas. Which is flammable. Flammable and explosive. Not good. And what about the work activities themselves? Yeah, those can be a source of hazards, too. Like welding. Welding fumes, gases, solvents, fuels, all those things can evaporate and hmm. create toxic or flammable vapors. Okay, so it's not just what's already there. It's what we bring in. Exactly. So you got to think about ventilation, respiratory protection, 
gas monitoring, all that good stuff. Yeah, so careful planning and monitoring. Absolutely. Okay, now what about structures that are near the excavation? Ah, uh, yes, good point. Because we've been focusing on the people inside. Right, the workers in the excavation. But if you're digging near a building, mm -hmm. that could cause problems too. It absolutely can. When you excavate near an existing structure, yeah. you're changing the support system for that structure. Okay. So that soil that was holding up the foundation, right. now it's gone. And that can lead to all sorts of issues. Instability cracking, even collapse. If you don't do it right. If you don't do it right. So OSHA uses the term support system to talk about okay. things that you use to support those adjacent buildings or underground installations. So I'm guessing these support systems are pretty specialized. They can be very complex. It depends on the situation. Yeah. Some common techniques are underpinning, yeah. which is where you extend the foundation of the building down to a more stable layer of soil. Okay. And then bracing, which uses temporary supports to transfer the load from the structure. So it's like a scaffold almost. Yeah, you could think of it like that. Holding everything up. Exactly. And the goal is to make sure that your excavation doesn't mess up the stability of those nearby structures. Right. So there's a lot to think about. There is. You guys consider the soil, the depth, the type of foundation. Right. It all matters. It all matters. Yeah. You need a good understanding of engineering and collaboration between everyone involved. The safety professionals, the engineers, the construction crew. Everybody. So excavation safety is a big topic. It is. It's not just one thing. Yeah. There's different types of excavations, protective systems, mm -hmm. unstable soil, hazardous atmospheres. It's a lot. It's a lot to keep track of. And it all comes back to those definitions we talked about. Yes. Because those are the foundation for keeping people safe. Absolutely. Those definitions aren't just some abstract concept. Right. They're how we figure out what's dangerous, how we communicate clearly, and how we make good decisions that actually protect workers' lives. So we've talked about the what and the why yeah. of excavation safety. We have. Defined those key terms and explained how they apply on the job site. Hopefully it's all making sense. But what happens when we ignore all this stuff? Yeah, that's the big question. What are the consequences of not following OSHA's standards? Let's find out. Find out. Welcome back to the deep dive. So we spent this whole episode all time. really getting into OSHA's excavation standards yeah you know defining those terms mm -hmm. talking about like what they mean how we apply them in the real world making it practical yeah and how important it is to collaborate communicate it's all about teamwork on these excavation sites but let's be real okay what happens when people ignore these standards yeah that's the big question what are the consequences i mean what are we really talking about here we're talking about serious injuries fatalities even when things go wrong in an excavation. Yeah, it's not just about paperwork yeah. and fines. It's yeah. about... People's lives. Yeah, people going home safe to their families. Exactly. Think about a trench collapse. Ooh, yeah. I mean, you're buried under tons of soil. Yeah. The force of that sudden collapse... These are fine. It can cause severe trauma, crush injuries, asphyxiation. Yeah, and it's not just the workers right. who are inside the trench. No, anybody who's near the edge can be swept in, struck by falling debris. Right, it can impact everybody. It can. And there are also, like you said, legal and financial consequences. Yeah, because companies can get hit with... Huge fines. Yeah, lawsuits. Lawsuits, and even beyond the money... Yeah. Your reputation. Nobody wants to be known as that company right. that cuts corners on safety. No, it's a lose-lose. It is. Yeah. You're risking the well-being of your employees, but you're also risking your company's financial stability and your reputation. Yeah. So it's not just about avoiding those penalties. It's about creating that culture. That culture of safety. Where everybody understands the risks and they feel empowered. Right. They take ownership. To prevent those accidents. Yeah. So how do we get there? Okay, so it starts with education. Okay. Make sure everyone on the site understands those OSHA definitions. Right, from the laborers. From the laborers. To the supervisors. To the supervisors. Mm. Have regular training sessions. Make sure resources are accessible. Easy to understand. Easy to understand. And encourage people to talk about safety concerns. So make it part of the conversation. Make it part of the conversation. Don't just assume people know what they need to know. Yeah. Make sure they do. And it's not just about classroom learning. Right. Get out there in the field. See what's happening. Observe what's going on. Give feedback. Right. Lead by example. Actions speak louder than words. Exactly. Show them that you're committed to safety by what you do. And if you see something that's not right, yeah. speak up. Don't be afraid. Be proactive, not reactive. 
Exactly. And document everything. Okay. Thorough inspections, accurate record keeping, detailed safety plans. Yeah. So you have a paper trail. You have a paper trail. To show that you've done your due diligence. You figured all the steps. To keep people safe. It's about building that safety net. Literally and figuratively. Yes. All right. Well, we've covered a lot in this deep dive. We have. We talked about OSHA's excavation terminology those key roles of the competent person and the registered professional engineer. Mm -hmm. And we discussed those, you know, really tough to think about consequences yeah. of not following the safety standards. But what we really want to emphasize is the importance of that open communication, yes. that continuous learning and that shared commitment to safety. It takes everybody. And as we wrap up, I want to leave you with this thought. Safety is not a destination. It's a journey. Ooh, I like that. It's an ongoing process of learning, adapting, and always trying to do better. We here at Safety One Source, we hope this deep dive has given you, you know, that solid foundation to navigate excavation safety. That's our goal. Keep learning, stay curious, and remember, we're always here to help you on your journey to a safer workplace. All right. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, stay safe out there.